morning. Like Jeff said, if you want to find out more about Grief Share, you can go to the uh, Welcome Center or you can go online and follow up with any information, times, dates, things like that there as well. We're glad you're with us. Uh, joining us online today, we're continuing in our series entitled Pastor's Choice. And some of you are looking at your watch going, we are way ahead of schedule this morning. And that is intentional. We're going to take some time at the end of service to practice what we preach. Okay, to, to walk through what we're talking about today. Now, I want to open this morning with an entirely fictitious story. All right, there's nothing true about this story. No names have been changed. No one was hurt in the making of this story. It is, there is nothing true about it. But I want to start with a story about a grandma and a grandpa. And they head to the family's home for Christmas. They're going to see their daughter and their son-in-law. They're excited about seeing all the grandkids. Grandma and grandpa show up and the grandkids are like, Grandma, Grandpa, excited to see them. Grandma and grandpa start bringing in the Christmas gifts for the kids. There's one trip. There's two trips. There's three trips. The kids are freaking out. There's four trips. It's like grandma and grandpa had a semi in the back of their little car. Kids are just so excited. And grandma and grandpa are like, kids, are you excited? We're here. Are you glad to have our presence? And the kids go, we love your presence. And they're tearing into everything. Fast forward to the next morning. Christmas is over. It's quiet. Their daughter and son-in-law are sitting at the table with grandma and grandpa. And the parents, daughter and son-in-law, like we're just glad to have some other adults around. We have been tired Things have been hectic. You know, the two of us have kind of been at each other. The kids are just out of control. Christmas break, everything else going on. Grandma and grandpa say, you know what? We see that. We see how tired you are. And, you know, we want to pay for you guys to get away. We want to pay all expense, trip, paid trip. Let us know what the spending money will be. We'll give you that too. The mom and the dad are like, that's nice, but we're just glad you're here. And grandma and grandpa go, well, don't you like our presence? And they go, yeah, we just love your presence. And I want to go on that play of words today and talk about the presence that we're blessed with, both presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, and presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, the presence of God. Because we are blessed by both, we should not look down on either. As a matter of fact, biblically, we have an appropriate response to both God's presence and his presence. And that's what we're going to look at today. Let's start with the presence, T-S, the blessings of God. The presence of God are what God has blessed us with. It is totally acceptable to praise God for what he has done, to appreciate his goodness in our lives. Have you ever gone and interviewed for a job? And maybe you have two or three jobs in the mix and you're like, ah, they're jobs. Their pay, very similar, but one job just has ridiculous benefits. 401k, matching, uh, dental, health, extra vacation time, on-site clinic, college funds for your kids, Everything else may be the same. But all of a sudden, there's something about the benefits that set this apart. When we look at our relationship with Christ, we have benefits that we can recognize as well. Psalm 103, verse 5. All the scriptures will be on the YouVersion Bible app or on the screens today. Psalm 103, verse 5. It says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all of our sins. Who heals our diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, 
so that we can find comfort, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We can praise God because of the amazing benefits, the blessings, the presence he has blessed us with. Acts 2, 46 and 47. The early church constantly was seeing the miraculous hand of God, the provision from the hand of God. And what does it say? It says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Psalm 95, two, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. The first question it forces me to ask is how many of us are here today thankful to be here? When's the last time you made a joyful, thankful sound to God? Thank you, God. In comparison, when's the last time you went, hey, God, this is wrong. Uh, Something's wrong over here. Lord, you need to fix this and fix them while you're at it. And God, I got a grocery list here. We'll get to that in a minute. When when was the last time you stopped and did what Psalm 95, two said and says, let's come into this place. Let's come into his presence. Let's recognize in his presence, the presence he's blessed us with and bring songs of praise. Isaiah 61, we'll look at two from Isaiah. Isaiah 61, it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. When you look at Isaiah and you see the judgment that God's about to pour on, to the people of Israel because they've turned their back on God. And yet Isaiah is coming on the scene and saying, listen, God will flip the script if we'll change our hearts. He says everything that's been weighing on you, he can change the storyline. Beauty instead of ashes. An oil of joy instead of mourning. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Isaiah 43, 20 says, the wild animals in the field will thank me, the jackals and the owls too, for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. I love how Isaiah is spelling out here. Even the animals recognize the good things God has done for them. Even the animals will stop and take time in their own way to thank God. Creation, scripture tells us, praises God, we have the ability to do so. Do we? Do we recognize God's goodness, his presence, his gifts in our life? And as I read these and and run through this, my my first question to, to you would be, what are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? What have you been blessed with? What have you been blessed by? And if you haven't stopped for a while to think about it, now's a great time. How have you been blessed? Some of you are saying, well, you know, I I really don't have anything to praise God for. You know, life's just kind of been life. I would question your awareness of God's goodness if that's your response. What do we have to be thankful for? Some of you are sitting beside them right now. Some of you drove it to get here this morning. Some of you left it as you came to the church building and and you had that wonderful cup of coffee and maybe breakfast. Some of you will get up tomorrow morning and go there and it will provide all of your bills for all of your bills. God has blessed us. Have we stopped and been thankful? Some of you need to recognize it every Mother's Day or Father's Day either when you make the call to them or when you get the calls in. We've been blessed. And we need to stop seeing it as a curse. Recognize the blessings God has given us. 
Some of you aren't even in good standing with God. You know things aren't where they should be. And yet even then you can stop and say, man, God has been better to me than he should have been. As a matter of fact, I bet a lot of us can say, God has been better to me than he should have been. Praise is a big, fat thank you to God for all that he has done for us. Thank God for his presence and take time to recognize, this is the second one, his presence. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, presence. Worship is the acknowledging of God's worship in our lives. When we recognize God's presence, his being with us, it's an acknowledgement of his worship in our lives. Romans chapter 12, verse one, it says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You see, we don't worship this. This is an offering that we give to God, to a holy God. And that's why it says we are to bring it to him and it's holy and pleasing to him. We're gonna come back to that in just a minute. Hebrews 12, verse 28 It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably. There's an acceptable worship to God, which means what? There's an unacceptable worship to God. We should show up, we should have a heart to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. You see, when we show up to worship God, and it's not just in a building, it's in whatever space we're in where we will stop and recognize God's presence in our life. We show up and it's not like, hey, my homie's here. This is God. This is an all-consuming fire. This is the holy and righteous and pure and right and good and faithful God. And we are not. Which is why the acceptable worship to God is to recognize who he is. Move past his hands and see his face. It's the presence of God. John chapter four, verse 24. Jesus says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And there's so many things that stand out to me about this passage that I love. Can we put that one back up? Thank you. Nope. Yep, that's it. Um, God is spirit. We know that. He's not flesh and blood. He's not just a man. And his worshipers, that's us, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. What is the opposite if we're not worshiping in spirit and in truth? If we're not worshiping in spirit from the depths of our heart and recognizing who God really is, we're worshiping from the flesh. What feels good, what we kind of like, is it the service we want, the song we want, the people we want, the worship leader we want, the organ we want, what is it? We can easily go from spirit to flesh. Jesus says God's people must worship him in spirit and in truth. What's the opposite of truth? A lie. It's a game we play. And when it comes to recognizing God's presence, we must recognize the truth of who God is. And it's found in the scriptures. It's found in his word. When we worship him, it's not just about the presence for our goosebumps. It's the presence because of who God is. One author said the true worship is based on a a right understanding of God's nature. And it is a right valuing of God's worth. John Piper says, so here's my summary. The inner essence of worship is to know God truly and then respond from a heart to that knowledge by valuing God, treasuring God, prizing God, enjoying God, being satisfied with God above all earthly things. And then that deep restful, joyful satisfaction and God overflows in demonstrable acts of praise from the lips and demonstrable acts of love in serving others for the sake of Christ. 
Please understand the presence of God is not based on the presence of a person. It's based on a God who says, I'll be there, who is holy, righteous, and true. If we get stuck on a person, we miss what God has called us to do in true worship. Scripture tells us church leadership, pastors, any, anybody in that role, that's a present, P-R-E-S-E-N-T, present to the church, but in no way is it to replace God. In no way is it to replace God. Let's go back to the Old Testament. There's a guy named Moses. Moses is a pretty incredible leader. He's leading, I talked about him a few weeks ago. He's leading the people of Israel out of slavery, out of bondage to a promised land. And it's not like a couple hundred people. Think of the city of Milwaukee being led through the wilderness to a new place. And Moses is the leader. And while Moses is the leader, God splits the Red Sea, delivers them from the most powerful army on the planet at that time. Pillars of fire, clouds to lead them. Manna showing up in the wilderness. Manna literally means, what is it? You think your cooking's a guessing game? What is it? I don't know, but I'm eating it because I'm hungry. Quail showing up. I mean, amazing thing God's, God does. Providing water in the middle of the desert. God does all this amazing stuff through Moses, but then something happens. And here's how it's summarized in Joshua chapter one and verse two. Moses, my servant, is dead. Well, that kind of puts a cramp on things, doesn't it? Joshua 1, beginning at verse 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all of these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Moses, my servant, is dead. But that doesn't mean God's dead. He turns his face, looks at Joshua and says, you're up. God's will, his plan will not be thwarted by any man. If you come for a man, you'll leave for a man. If you come for a woman, you'll leave for a woman. Set your eyes, set your heart on the folk and focus on the presence, presence of God. Don't lose sight of the face of his, the presence of God because of the absence of a person. God's presence will prevail. Now, this started as probably like a 19 part series that I'm boiling down to one message. So there are two things, there are several, but there are two that I'm gonna focus on that I see as kind of tripwires when we talk about worship within the church, when we talk about praise within the church, and I wanna address two of the biggies this morning. Here's the first one. The first one is music. It's music. Music is nothing more than the vehicle for our worship. It helps us express what's going on in a way that may be out of reach naturally. Music gets beyond walls. Music in a way is a good thing in a way that it helps us express. The good is that there's a cultural piece that it helps us relate, uh, helps relate when we're trying to say from our heart what we can't seem to get out. It helps us connect. Now that's the good. The bad is when we get so culturally wrapped up in a sound, a look, a feel that we can end up in a mess. Instead of treating it as an opportunity to worship, we treat it as a drug to feel good. We begin to worship the worship. There's a problem there. The music is a tool, it's an instrument. It is not the item we worship. We must worship in spirit and in truth. What do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. When Gina and I were dating, I used to write her songs. They were romantic songs. They were good. 
Now I want you to picture something. Picture me sitting at a piano, candle going. She's sitting, I don't play piano, but picture me sitting at a piano. And I'm like singing one of these songs that I've written for Gina or one of the poems, but I'll, I'll say a song. And, I, and this song is just like beautiful. This, the music is right. The lighting's right. Dinner's about ready. I've been working on it all day. I'll leave that alone. Um, but I begin to sing to her and I tell her how beautiful she is, how wonderful she is, what a blessing she is to my life how I just can't imagine life without her. She's the, she's the breath in my lungs. And I tell her she will be the favorite of every wife I ever have. <laughs> I don't care how good the music is, I'm dead. <laughs> we need to be careful when it comes to music. Can music be a tool? Absolutely. But if we get stuck in music and style and feel and we miss the truth behind it, we miss what worship is and who we're truly worshiping. It becomes more about how we feel about it than the person we're worshiping. Our praise and worship must be based on truth of who God is and what he has done and the grace and mercy shown to us on the cross. Music and lyrics count. Environment can encourage worship, but neither replaces the right heart. If you're joining us online, you may say, well, I'm not in the building. Does it count? Absolutely. Right where you're seated, right where you're standing in the car, you're driving. Your heart is where your worship comes from. And as you sing with the songs, if you're in the room or not, man, you can have that experience. You can have that presence with God. Why? Because he said, so we're going to see more of that in a minute. Now, there's a second thing I want to address when it comes to our praise and worship. This is a fun one. I'm going to talk about money. And some of you are going, you just ruined a good message, preacher. Let's talk for just a minute about money. Now, some of you are going to go, well, he's going to go Levitical law and the tithe. I believe in the tithe. I, I do tithe. Tithing is when you say, I give the first 10% to God. I've been practicing it. And you can go beyond Levitical law, Proverbs chapter three, verse nine. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Most of us don't get paid in crops nowadays. We don't get paid in badger skins or furs. We get paid in money. Please understand when I'm talking about money, I'm not talking about we need bigger offerings to keep the church out of debt. We function wisely as a church financially. What I'm talking about right now is our heart of worship to God and what is and what's not available to him. You see, your money is between you and him. I don't know what anyone gives. I couldn't tell you one dime of what anyone in this room gives. And I keep it that way. But what's your heart towards money in regard to worship to the Lord? Luke chapter 11 and verse 42. Luke 11 and verse 42, Jesus is speaking. He says, woe to you Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and all kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Jesus isn't saying you don't need to give anymore. Just love God. No, what is he saying? He says, you should be doing those first things. You should be giving the tenth. You should be giving out of what you have, but do it from a right heart. If you're doing it from the wrong heart, you miss the point. When we have an opportunity to worship, to recognize, to give back to God out of the presence, T.S., out of the presence he's blessed us with, when we have an opportunity to give to God as a gift, a worship to him out of our finances, I would challenge you not to miss the opportunity to do so. It is an opportunity to say, God, you're Lord over all of it. To recognize that the question you need to ask yourself is do I give to the work of God? Do I give to the house of God? Yes or no? Why and, or why not? Why or why not? When you look at everything your finances go to. And that's all I got to say about that. I want to give you four words kind of in closing this part out that are at the heart of praise and worship. Here's the first one. It's Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for. 
We are blessed and God has promised his presence in the good times, in the bad times, in the middle of the storm or in the tornado you may be facing right now. God says, my presence will be there with you. I'm holding on to you. I'm not going anywhere. Whether you're more focused on the wind and what's going on in the, in the, in the storm or you're focused on me, I'm there. And we can be thankful for that. I wanna challenge you to something. This is something that I've been practicing recently. When you make your prayer list, when you go to times of prayer, move beyond God I want, God can you fix, God this is wrong, and start with thanking him. How many of us in our prayer times, it's prayers for what we want? God, we lift up to you this because this person's sick and this because this bill is due and this because this boss is driving me nuts and this because the pastor talked about money and I don't like him anymore. What, you know, we go to all these things that we say, here's my prayer request. But what did Jesus say? When you pray, here's how you pray. My father who's in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. First of all, recognize how amazing and awesome and powerful. See the face of God before anything else. Holy is God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then there's one sentence. Give us this day our daily bread. And then it moves on. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, our trespasses, our wrongs as we forgive those who have wronged us. Lead us not into temptation, direct our steps. There's one line in it. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a holy God who says, I'm not gonna leave you. That's something that we should recognize in his presence. Make sure, I, Gina and I have started doing this. Make sure just three wins. At the end of each day, recognize three wins God has blessed you with in the day. Secondly, obedience. Worship, praise, requires obedience. It's a weird sounding word, but we are told to praise God. We are told to do so. We're actually commanded. One such example is in Psalm 150. Psalm 150, it says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the strings and pi pipes. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath, and everyone takes a deep breath. That's us. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise God. We've got a command to do so. John 4, 24, God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Some of you are thinking right now, yeah, I just don't like music. Like I, I'm not feeling it. That's okay. Here's what I would challenge you to. Make a top 10 list of the ways you've been blessed. You can't come up with 10, start with five. That's the start of your worship. Lord, here are my top five reasons I am thankful, over and out. Start from where your heart is. Maybe you're not a music person. It's not always about music. It's from a right heart. Recognize the blessings God has given you. Next is ministry. Thanksgiving, obedience, ministry. And some of you are like, oh, it is ministry. I feel so good after worshiping. And that's awesome, but that's an overflow out of what the ministry of praise and worship really is. Listen, when we gather together, teaching is for us. God doesn't need to be taught the Bible. He knows it pretty well. Teaching is for us. Praise and worship is for God. We minister to God with our praise and worship. We minister to him. Scripture talks about the acceptable worship, the, the, the worship that rises up to him. It's also a practice of heaven. It's recognizing his worship and who he is. So when we show up late, we're singing half-tailed, we're not really here, we're judging the people around, we're looking at shoes, hair, lights, the sound. When we're everywhere else, but recognizing his presence, T-S-N-C-E. Are we really ministering from a right heart to the Lord? 
because this is our chance to minister to him. When you have time during the week and you write up that top three or five list of wins or blessings, you're ministering to God. Recognize and take those opportunities. And finally, sacrifice. Sacrifice. A sacrifice is something that is beyond what is comfortable. It's beyond what you want to do. I had a worship leader growing up. He was from the backwoods of Virginia. And he used to say almost every Sunday, there's two times to worship the Lord. When you feel like it and when you don't. It's a sacrifice sometimes but it's a sacrifice from a right place in our heart. Let me give you an example. I'm gonna go back to Gina. Let's say I come home from work. It's been a long day of work and Gina goes, hey, can we go out for dinner tonight? And I say to her, it's been a long day and you know, going out is gonna cost money and I'm kind of tired and I, did you do anything today? I mean, yeah, if you wanna go out, I guess I'll sacrifice. I will end up with a frying pan beside my head Or I can come home from a long day of work and she goes, hey, can we go out to eat? And I go, it was a long day. I was out a lot, had a lot of meetings. But if that's what you want to do, I want to put your needs above mine. If that's what you want, it doesn't matter what I want. I will gladly sacrifice because I get to be with you. I get to enjoy the conversation. I get to have your undivided attention and you don't have to clean up. When can you be ready? You think there's gonna be a little difference in response from Gina at this point? One of them, I'm dead. The other one, dinner's gonna be kind of nice. We need to show up. We need to have the heart of worship and recognize that sometimes it is a sacrifice, but we don't do it for us. We do it for him. When we talk about sacrifice, I think communion gives us the perfect picture of what it's truly about. If you want to go ahead and get your communion cups out. The first piece of communion that we talk about is the bread. And as you open your cellophane, which I'm sure Jesus never said, by the way, (laughs) you see a wafer. And we recognize it as the bread we take before we drink the juice. But you have to understand, going back to the Old Testament, the Jewish practice, this was called the bread of presence. It was a loaf of bread that was put in the temple of God. It represented the presence of God and it was fresh each day, fresh bread from God. And it was this picture of God's provision of rain and wheat and man's work of making the bread as a worship of God brought to the temple. Your work is part of our, your worship. It's part of your praise. And this bread that was put on the altar in the temple, they would put incense on it to show that it was a sacrifice to God. It was the bread of presence. Now Jesus says, this bread is my body. Jesus says, I am that presence, which has been broken for you. You can take and eat the bread. We recognize his being here, his presence Then he takes the juice, the wine, our juice. Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. We're stuck in our mess and our rebellion. But Jesus says this blood is the blood of the new covenant, our new start. Talk about a blessing, a present he's given us, the ultimate present of the cross. He says, this is my blood, which has been shed for you. You can take and drink the juice. Now, having taken communion, what we want to do is for the end of the service, we're gonna, we've kind of flipped the script. We want to make this a time of worship, of praise, of recognizing God's goodness to us. What I would tell you is for the first song or two, if you want to sit, feel free to sit. If you want to kneel at your seat, feel free to kneel. If you want to stand, feel free to stand. It's not right now about the posture of your body. It's about the place of your heart. Can we recognize his gifts? Can we recognize and welcome his presence? Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, this morning as we came in the room, we came in from a lot of different places in life. Some people right now are in the mountaintops. Some people are trying to work through the valleys. 
But Lord, no matter where we are, you're there. And this morning as we've gathered together and we've talked about your goodness to us and blessing, as we've talked about your goodness to us and an ongoing presence for those who are in Christ, followers of Jesus. This morning, Lord, we welcome your presence here. We thank you that you are here. And as we sing these songs, as we pray these prayers in our seats, God, may it be a sweet aroma to you. As the incense was burnt in the Old Testament temple as a way of sending up an aroma to you, our song, the state of our heart is an aroma to you as well. You've been so good to us, Lord. May we never take it for granted. Hear us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.